Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning, morning. Jeff. Good, good morning. morning, Tom. Boy, we have a great show today. We have Tom, Tom Stevens with TomBot. And Ron, I think you're going to introduce Tom, aren't you? No, I'm going to start the show. You're going to introduce Tom. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this we, we have not done one of these shows for four months now. So I hope you guys all missed us. Uh, this, this show is going to be different. So this is the Baby Boomer Investing Show. And we normally do stuff about investing. And by the way, we started the show to warn baby boomers that they really should be protecting their life savings at this stage in their life. And as near as we can tell, most of, most of the baby boomers are not. But second to that, we really see serious trouble sometime in this decade. So two reasons. One, one is the smart thing is to protect your assets. The second is something bad is going to happen in this decade. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. <clears throat> But we, we have done other shows that aren't about investing. They've been about being happy in retirement. And those are our happy shows. This one's going to bridge between investing and retirement happiness. Uh, so when we talked about retirement happiness, we, we had three shows before about that. And they sort of boiled down to just three things, if you want to simplify it. Health, wealth, and purpose. So certainly you can't be happy if you're sick. So you need health. And wealth gives you the wherewithal to do the things you, you like and certainly to take care of your, your health. Then the third one is a sort of all-inclusive, and it can go into various levels, but in, in sort of a broad term, it's purpose. So we all want to feel when we wake up in the morning that we've got something to do and that, that it will matter. And that's really the bridge here. So we're going to talk about, at the end of the show, an ability to invest in something with a purpose. Uh, and we're going to talk about basically comfort, robot, robotic comfort animals. <clears throat> this one is called Jenny, uh, and the firm is called TomBot. And this kind of investment falls into the category that's come to be known as ESG, <clears throat> environmental, social, and governmental. And it's the current flavor of social investing. And what it really amounts to is this, I'll say the whole idea of ESG is being very aggressively marketed. So. You've probably heard about it. But the, the idea is to want to make money. You, you, you invest because you want to make money. But what if you could actually do a social good? If you could contribute to society and feel that your investments were uh, going to uh, benefit society. So that's today's show is going to bridge investing and retirement happiness. And I just wanted to call your attention to two things. One is Halloween is next week. It's my favorite time. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm dressed for that. <laughs> and today is the 34th anniversary of something um, that baby boomers would have heard of. On, on this day in 1987, the market had its biggest one day down uh, ever. It was down 25%. And that's called Black Monday. So historical fact. And I'm going to turn it over to Kathy to introduce our guest. Okay, well, first I want to say I have known Tom Stevens now for a little over two years. He has been on our show a couple of times, not this show, but I do other shows, uh, the Dog Connection show to be specific. And I was have been following and have loved what Tom has done. He has gotten to the point where he is so good at robotics for the for people in need people my age which are senior citizens and here we want to uh, Tom Stevens is the founder and the CEO of Tombot and he's a dad and he's a creator and he's going to explain to you a number of things so we're going to go into that Tom you might want to uh, identify what everything is about here yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kathy and Ron. Thank you for having me today. I'm very excited. Uh, yeah, and today is not Black Monday. Today is a Happy Tuesday. Right? There you go. With some clever thing. Maybe it's Taco Tuesday. Maybe we could go out and do that. <laughs> sure. But uh, today is a really great day. Um, so, yes, I'm Tom Stevens. I'm CEO and co-founder of TomBot. And more importantly, this is Jenny. Jenny is a fully interactive robotic emotional support animal. And she'll be the first to be both an FDA medical device uh, uh, and affordable. And what we'll do is we'll walk you through some slides, tell you a little bit about Jenny, as well as uh, 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 where we are on our journey and how you might be able to participate. 
So, uh, Kathy, if you'll uh, go to the next slide, please. So we'll dig in a little bit on the details of Jenny. So she's covered with sensors. She can feel how and where she's being touched. She can tell the difference between a simple touch, a slow caress, a vigorous pet, and being held. We come with a smartphone app that allows for a number of configuration settings, including renaming the robot. And then once named, uh, the robot will only respond to that given name. Jenny, want a treat? Uh, I'll bet you do, yeah. Uh, she can feel herself being moved and a variety of sensors, other sensors to help her understand her environment make an inference as to what's happening in her environment and then display a behavior that's relevant to that context. A um, couple other things. When you think about the technology inside a robot, think smartphone. So similar processor, similar memory, similar battery type and battery life. She's designed to last all day on a single charge under typical use and then be plug-in rechargeable overnight. Um, She's because she's a computer, she's fully software updatable, just like your smartphone. Uh, and she will be what the FDA considers to be a class two neurological therapeutic device that is 510k exempt. 510k exempt means that we don't have to prove that she's safe or effective before we start selling the product, we just have to meet all the safety certifications as well as follow uh, what are called good manufacturing practices or GMP, as well as the international standard for that, which is ISO 13485. So a lot of, a lot of acronyms, a lot of numbers, but basically she's a, she is actually a medical device and we'll, we'll get into that uh, a little bit more. Um, next slide, please. So what is she? Uh, first of all, she's a companion and an emotional support animal. What she is not is meant to displace a live animal. Uh, a number of people uh, uh, indicate concerns about, you know, what about all those uh, very needy animals in shelters across America that, that need homes? And we are big fans of, of shelter animals. We are uh, rescue uh, animal owners ourselves. Um, for people who can safely and practically care for a live animal, a live animal is always going to be a better alternative in terms of your, your ability to establish an emotional connection. But Jenny is for people who cannot safely or practically care for live animals, uh, primarily due to a health adversity, um, but also there are many people that have chosen to no longer uh, have live animal companions. Uh, for example, live animal ownership plummets after age 75, and there are a few reasons for that. Um, the first and certainly the most common reason cited is that people no longer want the burden of caring for an animal, um, feeding it, taking it out uh, for exercise, cleaning up after it, um, just, and animals are hard on homes, so there's a lot more maintenance to a home that's required when you have an animal, and sure. many people decide that they're no longer uh, interested in doing that. Um, secondly, uh, uh, animals are expensive. A lot of seniors, uh, particularly those on fixed incomes, uh, decide they just don't want that expense. Americans spend about $1,500 a year on average for, uh, for a dog. Um, that, that includes the initial purchase price as well as the veterinary bills, which increase as the dog ages. And then lastly, uh, uh, and what one that uh, sort of I can relate to, uh, is people don't want to grieve for the loss of another pet. Um, the, the very sad fact is that dogs and cats don't live that long. Uh, dogs live about 10 to 13 years, depending on which study you read. Um, cats live on average about 15 years. And, and of course, they're outliers. Uh, there was one cat that uh, lived for 38 years. Kind of, oh, wow. Uh, amazing long life, although I suspect the last decade or so of its life it had a lot of health issues um, uh, as these animals seem to collect those as they age. But at some point, you know, if you're young enough and healthy enough, a pet that you're going to own is probably going to pass away. Another so, Tom, we, our, our puppy is going to be th three years old next week. 
And when we lost our other dog, my wife didn't want to bring up a puppy. And, I, and puppies are hard. Yeah, they are. So we wanted to adopt. And my wife went crazy trying to find a two-year-old, three-year-old puppy. She didn't want a, a 10-year-old because it was going to die pretty soon. But the adoption agencies, Kathy probably knows this better than us, said we were too old for a two-year-old. <laughs> It, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's a consideration because one of the one of the challenges. What happens if the pet survives the host? That's what, really what they're concerned about. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, um, fortunately, there are organizations out there that deal with this, um, uh, and so people, if they want to try raising a puppy, or uh, even though they may not, they, they may feel that the puppy survives uh, them. There are organizations out there that specialize in reholding those. Um, one oh. organization is called Paws for Elders, P A W S, the number. Oh, nice. That's good to know. And we elders. ended up taking a, a brand new puppy just because we weren't having any luck in, in adopting a, you yeah. know, one that was two or three years old. Yeah. And, so, and she's uh, been a handful. She, <laughs> <laughs> she, she's a great dog, actually, but she, she was, yeah. Raising what? a puppy is really hard. Yeah, I mean, one of the other things, too, is that a lot of people don't think too much about what breed of uh, dog to get. Um, dogs that are working animals need to be kept busy. Uh, if it was bred to work, um, if you don't keep it busy, it's going to find something to do. And generally speaking, you're not going to like what it chooses yeah, to do. Sure. So, so, so matching the, the breed of dog, um, on our website, tombot.com, we have a, a few resources, including an article on breeds of dogs that are appropriate uh, for seniors or preferred uh, uh, by seniors. There's also an interview with a veterinarian that talks about these issues, too. Um, um, once again, where a dog and cat can be safely and practically cared for, it's always going to be a better emotional connection for you. But for those people that don't, that's where we come in. So Jenny is a golden retriever, right? She's actually a yellow Labrador retriever. Yeah. Oh, Labrador. Uh, okay, yeah, Labrador. Labrador yeah, okay. fur is slightly shorter than the uh, the fur of a golden retriever, but otherwise they look fairly similar. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. She's yeah. cute. Labrador. And they both serve very well as service dogs or companion dogs or therapy dogs because they have such a, a great disposition and they're always very calm, good with kids, all of that. So the yeah, breed itself calm. is they're phenomenal. Calm. Yeah, they're calm after their puppies. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's a very funny and touchy movie that Owen Wilson did a number of years ago called Marley and Me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that the, his experience obviously was was uh, very exaggerated for for comedy purposes. But uh -huh. puppies, regardless of the movie. breed, puppies are gonna puppies are gonna be a lot of work. Right. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, so next slide, please. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we realized is that uh, 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 people like uh, realistic robotic animals. We did multiple rounds of customer studies with hundreds of seniors and what we found is a very strong preference for realism. Uh, so realism in appearance, realism in texture, but most importantly realism in behaviors. I'll talk a little bit more about the founding team, but we're tech people. We had no idea how to do that. We knew how to make a robot, but we knew, had no idea how to make a robot look like a real animal. So we reached out to the animatronics community in Hollywood and teamed up with Jim Henson's Creature Shop, uh, the people behind the Muppets, Sesame Street, the Dark Crystal movie and series on Netflix, uh, as well as uh, dozens and dozens of very realistic, uh, yeah, you'll get a chance to talk, uh, very realistic uh, dogs and cats for, for movies, television, and, and commercials. And they did all of our artistic design. And so if you like the way she looks, that's really, she's really the youngest Muppet. I, I like to say that she's Kermit the Frog's youngest sister. Uh, uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, uh, but really wonderful people there. There's uh, actually a video on our website that's behind the scenes. So if you're big Jim Henson fans, uh, uh, please do check that video out and meet some of the people that worked on this project with us. Very cool. Well, this um, brings us to now, Tom. So why did you develop Tombot? So the real reason behind Tomba uh, uh, is that she is a medical device. She's to solve a real health problem. So at her heart, uh, 
she is an FDA medical device. Uh, next slide, please, Kathy. Okay. This is my mother. Um, so a little bit about my background is I've been in the high tech industry for 35 years. My two Tombot co-founders and I built a prior startup into one of the world's largest legal automation companies. Uh, we were successfully acquired in 2011, which gave me the freedom to think about other things. Unfortunately, that same year, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia, and we had a number of really bad events early on. Um, the first one was I had to move in a caregiver, and that was really hard on her. Uh, she had, since my parents divorced, my mom prided herself on living independently. So the idea of having somebody there around the clock to, to help take care of her was very upsetting to her. Second bad event, is I had to take away her car keys. Uh, she was playing bumper cars uh, out on the road. And of course, oh they, of course it was never her fault. Um, but neither of those events compared to the third one when I had to take away her dog for safety reasons. She had a two-year-old golden doodle, uh, a beautiful dog with ordinarily a lovely disposition that she managed to train to be aggressive towards her caregiver. One of the big problems, <laughs> yeah, one of the big problems. How mean is that? <laughs> yeah. one, of, one of the big problems uh, uh, with Alzheimer's and other causes of dementia is it frequently uh, see personality changes. Um, and it could go either way. Um, my mother was one of the kindest people you'll ever meet, do anything for anybody. She was a special education uh, teacher for her career. Um, uh, uh, um, but she hated the fact that she had a caregiver in. And somehow the dog sensing my mom's displeasure reacted to that. Uh, when a caregiver in, the caregiver entered her room, the dog would growl. And my mom would laugh and pet the dog, reinforcing that behavior. Wow. And very quickly, we had a real uh, uh, safety issue on our hands. So we had good family friends that wanted to take the dog. And the dog's still enjoying a, a great life with that. But my mom was devastated. Uh, um, every day is, why can't I have my dog? When am I getting my dog back? Uh, uh, you know, this is so mean of you. Why would you do this to me? Kind of conversation. Yeah, sure. And, and then at the same time, what what you didn't have was an alternative. You didn't know what to do to how to replace it. Isn't that what really happened, Tom? That's right. So I started doing some research, and uh, I, I found some things that some people felt were um, uh, substitutes for live animal companions. I'll talk a little bit more about the details. But my mom didn't like or respond to any of those. And so I started wondering if an advanced robot might actually uh, uh, perform better, perform better in terms of the appeal uh, uh, to my mom. And, and, this, the, and this mission was really about solving my mom's problem. Uh, so uh, uh, that launched me on a multi-year research and education journey, which culminated in a master's degree from Stanford. And along the way, I learned that my mom's story isn't unique, that there are uh, tens of millions of people here in the U.S., hundreds of millions around the world that cannot safely or practically care for a live animal due to health adversity um, uh, and therefore miss out on the many mental and physical health benefits associated with the human-animal bond. Um, and what we learned is that we could actually make a difference for seniors with dementia. Um, next slide, please. So the, the first version was with your your mother, and, um, and and so you're on the the sixth generation now. Jenny is a sixth generation. Is that? That's right. So yeah, in the right. photo, uh, the photo of my mom actually shows her holding one of our very early uh, yeah, right. uh, generation robots. You know, and towards the end of her life, she passed away in 2018. But towards the end of her life, um, she couldn't remember what she had for breakfast on a given day. Mm -hmm. But she always remembered that I was working on robots for her. It was what she wanted to talk about. <laughs> oh. Yeah, very cool. Do you have another robot for me? I go, no, Mom. Uh, she would love Jenny, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So she, she did get to meet Jenny, although she didn't get to spend as much time with her as I would have liked. Okay. Um, 
Seniors with dementia, uh, so why are we a medical uh, uh, device? Um, seniors with dementia suffer from something called behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, or BPSD symptoms. Those include loneliness, depression, frustration, in my mother's case, hallucinations, and violent anger. Wow. Um, to manage these symptoms, doctors frequently prescribe psychotropic medications. These are anti-anxiety, antidepressant, and antipsychotic medications. And not only do these medications turn seniors like my mom into zombies, they carry grave health risks, uh, uh, particularly from the antipsychotics, which leaves doctors with a terrible choice. Either don't medicate seniors like my mom and risk them being out of compliance with their basic day-to-day -day care needs, or medicate them and risk killing them. Uh, additionally, over 80% of seniors who live in nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, suffer from chronic pain. Um, and if you've been reading the paper at all uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, you'll know that opioids are particularly dangerous for treating chronic pain. Still the, the, uh, the best practice for treating acute and short-term pain, for example, post-surgical pain, uh, but for chronic pain, uh, they're highly problematic. So doctors are looking for alternatives to these two classes of medications. Next slide, please. Um, this is a very well-researched area. There are over 150 peer-reviewed studies that have been performed uh, going back as many as 40 years. And what they show is that where a senior with dementia can form a robust emotional attachment to an object, traditionally it's a human baby doll or a stuffed animal, that senior gets a great deal of relief from their behavioral and psychological symptoms and a corresponding reduction in need for those psychotropic medications. The problem is very few seniors actually form the necessary emotional object attachment to the traditional object. Uh, we estimate that it's less than 1%. Uh, research on robotic animals show they significantly outperform the traditional objects and have the added benefit of reducing pain and the need for pain medications. The problem there is existing technology are either simple children's toys that have been rebranded for seniors or they are prohibitively expensive robots. In the lower right-hand corner of the screen is a robotic seal from Japan called Paro, P-A-R-O. It's an excellent robot, but it costs over $6,000. Most senior care facilities cannot afford one, let alone individuals who need one for themselves in order to form that emotional bond. I read on the internet that a firm in Boston charged $72,000 for its robotic dog oh so that's boston dynamics uh, yeah. uh so it's a wonderful <laughs> so so one of the many uh if if you if you if you like watching silly stuff on the uh on social media and the internet uh do a search for uh boston dynamics or, or simply spot s-p-o-t mini m-i-n-i -I, uh and you'll see all kinds of creative things um the, uh, the big joke with uh, Boston Dynamics is that their robot is part of the, uh, the robot uprising, uh, going to take over the world. Um, oh, wow. Okay. It, it's actually, it's actually, Boston Dynamics product is actually not appropriate for individual use. It's, it looks like a very serious mechanical device, which it is. It, it's, uh, it's really meant for industrial applications oh, okay. not really a comforting animal you wouldn't look at that and say oh that makes me <laughs> that makes me happy just being around it um mm -hmm. uh maybe as sort of a terrifying watchdog but uh but not as a an emotional attachment object. wow okay so so different purpose uh it's actually wonderful technology uh, but but different different market different customer uh intended by that Sure. Well, so, right so Tom, Tom, second here. So this might be a good time to mention about the um, the joy dog that that is the emotional. Well, it, they claim it's an emotional support dog. It's a it's a great thing, but it's a toy, isn't it? That's what it doesn't have the function that Jenny does. Yeah. At the other end of the spectrum is a company called Ageless Innovation, who makes the Joy for All products. These products are actually spun out of Hasbro. They were originally children's toys, part of Hasbro's For Real line. Um, 
that had some appeal for seniors. So they rebranded the product Joy for All and not just Joy for Kids and then set it up as, a, as its own company. Wow. They're really nice people. Uh, I've, uh, I've spent a little bit of time with, with the, uh, the CEO and, and some of the other members there. And they're really doing great work. Um, but it's at the other end of the spectrum. It really is a very simple mechanical toy. Not really an advanced robot. Uh, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's it's lightly interactive. Uh, uh, doesn't have rechargeable batteries. Doesn't have much computational capability, and it's certainly not realistic. Um, uh, but for people who cannot afford, uh, our robot will cost uh, a little under five hundred dollars. Um, uh, but for people who cannot afford that. Uh, the, the Joy for All products sell for about $130. So it's it, it's also a good way to see if mom or dad might like to uh, try one out before you have the expense uh, uh, on a Tombot product. Um, they sell a lot of them. Uh, uh, they're doing a lot of good in the world, but it's it's a different um, it's a different type of product. Uh, they're in the right hand column of this competitive matrix. We're in the far left hand column. And there are a couple of other uh, uh, robots featured there too. Um, the middle is Paro, the robotic seal. Uh, and if you're just looking purely at check marks, you know, of course, we have the most uh, that are on that. But they're they're in areas that really matter. Uh, so we we're rechargeable, we're servo driven, which means that we're going to have more capabilities. We do respond to voice commands. We're FDA uh, medical device. Software upgradable, uh, and lastly, realistic, uh, realistic appearance, realistic behaviors, and we're the only one that uh, in that category. We believe that we are making the world's most realistic robotic animal. Um, so the uh, we have a two prong business model. Um, we sell directly to the family members on behalf of the seniors with dementia. We also distribute through hospitals, assisted living, and skilled nursing uh, facilities. Um, next slide, please. So we, uh, uh, sort of the good news, bad news is uh, we have about 8,800 pre-order and waitlist customers, um, which represents about uh, a full year's worth of our initial production. We're looking at first customer shipments in the summer uh, of 2023. Um, uh, but people who are just joining our waitlist today may need to may wait as much as another year. Uh, um, so, from an investment standpoint, uh, our our customers come from 76 different countries uh, and include over 500 organizations such as hospitals, assisted living, skilled nursing. We estimate it's well over 10,000 robots because um, uh, we'll allow people to place order for more than one uh, robot uh, when they convert their waitlist uh, entry into an actual and official order. Uh, but uh, for people that oh, one other fact. Uh, uh, Despite all of our early marketing being on behalf of seniors with dementia, about 30% of our pre-order and waitlist customers have come in for other use indications, including adults with anxiety, uh, uh, major depressive disorder, chronic pain, PTSD, and children with autism and other special needs. Now, we haven't studied these other markets yet. Um, we don't know that this version of Jenny, which is our minimum viable product, is really the right product for those other markets. But we're happy to sell a robot to anybody who comes to us. Um, once we're once we have this Jenny out the door, we'll study those other markets and most likely develop more advanced technology to make sure that we're appealing to people that are more cognitively healthy than seniors with dementia. Um, but when you combine this with our initial uh, uh, go to market customer or seniors with dementia, it, uh, it actually opens up hundreds of millions of people around the world who could potentially be customers for us. So the Jenny we're looking at, Tom, is she's not done yet. Okay. Yeah, another, another two years of development. Is that? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, well, yeah, uh, hopefully less than two years at this point, we're looking at summer of 2023 and earlier if we can make it. Um, which uh, which brings us to the investment side of the company. If you could go to the next slide, please, uh, yeah. Kathy. 
Um, so we are we are raising money uh, to bring our product the rest of the way to, to market. So we're using the money to increase our engineering staff to perform what's called production engineering. Um, Jenny was developed specifically for customer studies. We knew we had to create a high fidelity version in order to uh, get seniors with dementia to, to give us the feedback we need to know that we were headed in the right direction. And as, as you pointed out earlier, we're, we're on our sixth generation of prototypes. So there was a lot of iteration to figure out what we needed. Um, so the production engineering is meant to make the, the shipping version more robust so it'll survive everyday use. Uh, make her in such a way that we can pass all the safety certifications, including the FDA safety certifications, uh, and to be manufacturable at scale so that we can bring our costs down from thousands of dollars per robot to hundreds of dollars a robot and, and bring them to customers as inexpensively as we do. Um, we'll also be using that money to tool up our, our contract manufacturer to do our alpha and beta testing to gain those safety certifications. And then lastly, uh, it'll be the working capital to manufacture our first 2,500 robots. Uh, and, and, and Tom, when we spoke before, I think you had said something about that you're, you're, you're taking a very realistic and very cautious approach in terms of uh, cl client acquisition at this point because you have more than enough orders for the first first uh, round uh, so you want to make certain that it's a perfect item before it goes out You're, uh, thank you for uh, bringing that up kathy yes uh the uh, the good news is the media loves us we've had close to 400 media covers from all the major tv and radio uh, stations. We've, we've had coverage from uh, the major online and print publications, not only here in the U.S., but internationally. Um, probably the most significant of those was the BBC that took us to all the countries that, that they're carried in, and that's really the driver behind why we have uh, 76 different countries on our customer wait list. Um, and that's, that's allowed us to build that without spending any money. But one of the, and so we're conserving all of our capital towards the engineering. Um, we have a higher bar to clear than most products. Um, we need our customer to literally love our product and not like you love your coffee maker or you love your television or you love your, your cell phone. Um, really, have, uh, customers have to form that, that uh, robust emotional attachment in order to deliver the medical good. Uh, so if our first products off, off the line are not what our customers are expecting, then we fail. And so we're taking a very cautious approach to, uh, to bring the product to market. We're being very thorough with the engineering and testing, and it takes longer and it costs more money. But the trade-off there is that our first shipment should be just what our customers want and, uh, and not less than that. Great. Okay. We're raising, we're currently raising a $5 million round. We've raised about $4 million to date. And this new $5 million round is to do all the activities uh, that we talked about. Um, um, uh, we're, we're raising money a couple of different ways. We're, uh, actually, I can't remember if this is on the next slide. Uh, I, I, yes, please go to the next slide. So we're raising a couple of different ways. Um, the traditional way to raise money for a startup company is through institutional investors and accredited investors. An accredited investor is uh, the SEC's way of saying that you have a lot of money, uh, that you make at least $200,000 a year in income, uh, or you have at least a million dollars worth of net worth outside of your primary residence. So anybody who meets that criteria can invest directly in a startup company like Tombot. Uh, and, and most of the $4 million that we've raised to date has come through these types of investors. But we also opened up an equity crowdfunding campaign on, uh, on Start Engine. Uh, Start Engine is a platform for doing these things. And that allows us to raise money from people who have less money uh, than an accredited investor and have a very low minimum investment price. Our minimum investment for somebody through our Start Engine campaign is $249. Uh, 
Uh, and the benefit, uh, in addition to owning shares in Tombot, the other benefit is if you're eager to not wait a year, uh, if you're joining our wait list just today and you don't want to wait a year to get your robot, anybody who invests in our campaign will be on our priority wait list it basically moves you up to the very front of the line so you'll you'll be among our initial shipments um but our campaign ends on november 2nd so if you're curious please Hurry. check us out right yeah. away uh and if you're an institutional or accredited investor and are interested in investing fifty thousand dollars or more we would love to talk to you directly um uh, so for more information uh please go to our website which kathy is showing it's www.tombot.com, T-O-M-B-O-T.com. And if you click on the investors tab at the top, uh, go, uh, actually, uh, if you could go back, Kathy, um, to the, uh, yeah, on the very top of the page underneath the Tombot logo, there is an investors uh, Oh, tab. there, okay. If you click on that one, that will give you all the information you need, including a, a link to take you through our Start Engine page. But there's a lot of information uh, on this. It talks a little bit about what we've shared today and other details uh, about the investment. Uh, and so uh, we hope that you will help us bring Tombot puppies to those people desperately in need. So the preferred shares, Tom, are non-voting, right? That's correct. Preferred shares. Uh, uh, Basically, the difference between a common share and a preferred share is that a preferred share has liquidation preferences. So if something bad happens to Tombot and we need to liquidate the company, people who own preferred shares get their money back before uh, uh, before the Tombot owners do, who have common shares, um, uh, but they are non-voting. Got it. And are they preferred as the dividends too? Or is it other shares paying any dividends yet? Do you anticipate they will be paying dividends? Or I, uh, so uh, a qualified yes, we do anticipate that, but it's still a ways off. And really, all okay. of the all of the retained earnings in the company are being uh, will be uh, reinvested because we're a high growth opportunity. Sure, um, we're currently uh, forecasting. Uh, a couple hundred million dollars worth of revenue uh, in 2025, which will generate approximately $95 million in EBITDA. And based upon very conservative multiples, um, that makes us a billion dollar company. If we can get Wall Street to value us as a medical robot, which is our intent to do, um, we could be four to 10 times that number. Uh, and we also have some other things that we're not talking about publicly that could really allow us to generate some outlier results. So, uh, nice. so we're we're a high growth company, and so rather than generating dividends, we want to keep increasing the value of the company, and then give people the option uh, for. Jenny wants to invest. Look, listen to yeah. her. <laughs> yeah, right. I want yeah. in. This sounds great. <laughs> yeah, Jenny, Jenny will take those dividends and invest them back in electricity. So there's more there power. You go. So, so tell us about the maintenance for Jenny. They're, they're charging her up and cleaning her. And... She's, uh, it's a great question. Uh, so from an overall maintenance standpoint, she's designed to be maintenance-free. However, as we learned with my mother, who fed her robot chocolate pudding, we do need to be able to clean it. Uh, sure. So there, there, are three ways, there are three ways in which Jenny can be cleaned. Um, he, uh, for home use, which is likely to be used in a non-shared environment, so an individual who is a primary user. Um, uh, uh, if she has dirt or debris or chocolate pudding on her, she can be wetted. Um, you can actually take a glass of water and dump it on her and she'd be okay. Don't submerge her in water. Don't put her in a bathtub. Don't take her into the swimming pool. She does not like to swim. Uh, uh, that would be the end of her. But. Um, uh, but you, she can be wetted, and wow. using a wet washcloth with a mild soap or detergent, you can take the dirt and debris out of her fur and remove the oils uh, from your hands that might transfer onto the fur and restore it to that, that very nice luster that you see on her. Um, for a shared use environment, for like a, a, uh, an assisted living or skilled nursing facility where the robot may be passed from one person to the next, we want to make sure that she does not spread 
infections. Um, sure. Obviously, in the day, in this day and age with COVID, it's it's an abundant concern. But even without COVID, uh, uh, people and in, in those environments are vulnerable to infection. Um, research out of the UK shows that if you spray uh, with an antimicrobial spray and follow it up with an antimicrobial wipe, you not only clean the robot, but you mitigate uh, all detectable pathogens, including COVID. Um, so it could good. be that nice. uh, Jenny could be uh, rented at some point. That's our anticipation. Or at least, okay. That's our anticipation. One of, the, uh, one of the use indications is for people have fear of flying. Uh, the, the FAA has greatly restricted uh, well, actually, they no longer mandate carriers uh, to uh, to allow you to bring your emotional support animal on the plane because people abuse that. Uh, the carriers still have the option of allowing it. They still are required uh, to allow you to bring a service animal, but they're no longer uh, required for you to take a, an emotional support animal on the plane. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we anticipate people that have uh, fear of flying, but still need to fly, like business travelers who have high anxiety about this, bringing their, their, their Jenny on board the plane and, and using Jenny as a uh, comfort animal uh, and dropping it off at the other end of the flight. Uh, uh, so cool. uh, be rented for the purposes of the flight, and um, we, we see that as a use uh, opportunity as well. Hi, Richard. Richard. Th thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Tom, Richard has a question. Can the bark volume be adjusted? And I think that's through the Smart App, isn't it? It, it actually is. So there are a number of configuration settings uh, that can be made. Um, one, of the, one of the things we learned in doing our research is people that have fear of animals, so can canine phobias, um, the bark behavior uh, as well as rapid movement is a trigger for that fear response. So we can turn off the bark, we can turn off, uh, we can turn down the volume, turn it off entirely, uh, any behaviors that are barking, as well as any behaviors that exhibit rapid movement um, so that people have a, a very calm, quiet uh, uh, companion. Since you're on that topic, the voice recognition, can Jenny be trained to react to certain voice commands or how, how does it all work? She does. She comes with a, uh, so Jenny, the prototype has, has quite a few different commands that, uh, uh, that she can do. We're actually interested in customer feedback as to what other commands uh, uh, people would like to see. Um, we've done a lot of work on the electrical engineering. So the, the voice recognition and command recognition capability in our production version will work very, very well. Um, and so there are a large, large variety of things that she'll be able to respond to. Um, we're also uh, looking to get multi-language support uh, as well, so uh, oh, wow. for international customers. I, I see that she sits very well. She yeah. stay, stay. <laughs> uh, with, uh, for this version, she lays comfortably on your lap or on a table or chair, someplace where she can remain within uh, close contact with the person who's using her. We learned that for seniors with dementia, anything on the floor is an extreme tripping hazard. Sure. Uh, and a fall uh, late in life is oftentimes an end of life event. Um, mm -hmm. If not immediately, uh, they just never recover from uh, from the trauma of the fall and, and, and quickly pass away after that. So yeah. never on the floor. Uh, uh, and we actually had an earlier version that could stand up and roll over and we realized that uh, though it was cute and, and fun to watch, it actually created a safety hazard. So, yeah, you so, shared with us that your mother broke her leg, right? My mom did. She fell and broke her leg. Actually, a little short story, if I may share that. Um, sure. Um, late, late in my mom's dementia, um, she was using a walker, and despite that, she fell. Um, my mom remained, up until that point, she remained quite mobile, uh, but we had her use a walker just for increased security. Despite that, she fell and she broke her leg. Uh, she broke her femur, her thigh bone, and uh, and a terrible break. It just where the femur inserted into an artificial knee that she had. Very, very painful. Um, when she was admitted into the hospital, however, um, she not only had to be treated for the trauma of her broken leg, but she also had to be treated for the dementia. Um, when, a, when a medical professional entered her room, she would scream in terror, thinking that 
that that medical professional was there to hurt her worse. And my mom was a hitter. My mom could hit. Uh, <laughs> Irish. That's not Irish funny. Mom, I'm sorry. Yeah. Irish mom, athlete her whole life. She was fairly yeah. strong boom, despite, boom, boom. Her, uh, despite her late stage dementia. So they had to they had to physically and chemically restrain her in order to get her to be compliant with her, her desperate wow. um, medical needs until I brought her robot in from home. I wish I had thought of it right away, but a couple days went by and I realized that, you know, something had to change. I brought her robot in from home and she clutched it very tightly to her chest and she would say, Bob, she named her robot Bob. Bob is helping me relax. And she was still oh. afraid, yeah, she was still yeah. afraid. Oh. but from that moment forward, she was fully medically compliant, didn't ah. yet need any medic, uh, any physical or chemical restraints from that point forward. And so oh. that was so not sorry. only informative for us, but also from a quality of life uh, perspective from my mom, hugely, yeah. hugely important. Uh, Rom Roman says, uh, are there any other loom options? Uh, you're talking about fur, uh, so uh, I, I, I'm guessing that's there's, there's a word loom. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, Ro Roman is uh, a dog expert, just so you know. So it, yeah. So, uh, the, so this look. is our. Oh, there first. any other look? No look. Oh no, look. look. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, same, same thing. Uh, so I was learning this, a new is word. Our, this is our first product to market. She is a yellow Labrador Retriever puppy. But if I may tease you a little bit, we don't generally talk too much about uh, futures. But uh, you might not be surprised if we come out with other fur and other colors uh, for this version, as well as other uh, breeds in the future, and maybe another species or two. So, oh. so lots of lots of other stuff, uh, as well as additional technology that we'll add for future birds. Let me guess, you're going to do a giraffe? Yeah. Well, right. the funny, yeah. If enough people wanted a giraffe, we would make <laughs> yeah. a giraffe. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things we get people requesting all kinds of odd things, like people really? want. Uh, why not have a unicorn or a space alien? <laughs> yeah, right. If, yeah. Enough, yeah. if enough people want it, we won't, I don't expect this ever to be in a situation where we can make a truly custom yeah. uh, looking animal because there's so much engineering that goes into each different uh, breed. But uh, uh, but I do. Ex there's a lot of customization electronically. We'll be able to customize the robot to match the personality interests of the uh, of the owner oh well now sure. that's but that's we, but interesting. We will, come out with, we will come out with other options that's fun jim henson's got okay. kermit uh, nailed so you got that one yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to mention here that now that you're on the show or that you're watching roman roman is uh, a, a co-host on the dog connection show and he is also uh, a behaviorist one of the things that i love about this is the fact that there's some like Ron was alluding to that they tried to get a dog, they couldn't get a dog because they're too old to get them. Well, there's also the case where you think, okay, mom needs a dog. Mom says, oh, I, I really want to have a dog. I, I, I'm so lonely. And you say, mom, you can't have a dog because you're not going to take it for a walk. You're not going to do anything. There has never been an alternative before. And when shelters ha or rescues have to tell someone that they cannot adopt a dog because of age or because of their, their mental or physical condition, that's very disheartening. Sure. And they will go to measures to try and get a dog in any other way, but there are rules and regulations. So this is a really great marriage between uh, the the healthcare industry and the uh, rescue industry and the shelter industry. So I see us bridging that gap and saying, let's offer this as an alternative. Uh, I also want to add that, as you can see, I have COPD, and recently I found that I cannot be around shedding dogs without having an exasperation or possibility of ending up in the hospital. I'm in a very serious condition at this point, and thank God my dog is not, um, uh, he, he doesn't shed. But what if I did have something like that? That would have been a major problem. So I tried to convince Tom to put me on the beta test list so that I could do that for COPD. You just want another dog. I want another dog. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to twist my arm too much for that, Kathy. Okay, good. <laughs> but, oh, uh, here's yeah. a good question. Can it also give information like Alexa? Uh, we, we, in our customer surveys, um, 
people want the robot to, or pardon me, the people want the dog to always be a dog. They don't want it to be a human. So they don't want to ask the robot what's the weather. They don't want to ask, you know, the latest trivia question. Good point. Um, they want it to be a dog. They want it to be even more realistic, more and more realistic. So we don't anticipate um, our robotic animals uh, being conversational, uh, you know, uh, with, with human language. Um, um, unless, unless some point in the distant future, uh, that makes sense to have a special model for that. But for now, because she's a medical device, because people want to take care of her, uh, um, that's really how people want to bond. Um, now, one of the things that you know, you're asking, so good questions, Roman. One of the thing that uh, one of the things that people talk about. Well, what? If, why not have it find things? You know, dementia people are dementia people. Uh, that's a, that's actually a really interesting question. Dementia people forget stuff. Well, if you if you are diagnosable with dementia, you probably shouldn't be living on your own anymore. You probably should be living with a family member or a professional caregiver or living in a shared uh, situation like assisted living so someone can make sure that you're safe uh, and getting your day-to-day -day care needs done all the time. Um, but if someone's looking after you like a family member, 83% um, of seniors with dementia actually live at home and are cared for by an unpaid family member, and that's most likely to be a daughter or daughter-in-law. Um, what about the needs of that caregiver? That family caregiver is burdened for that. So one of the things that we're doing is, is through our smartphone app is making their life easier. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about the futures of those, those uh, capabilities, but there's a lot of work that we're doing with the smartphone app to make caring for a person with senior, uh, a senior with dementia. Oh, that's marvelous. A, a, much, a much more wow. uh, consistent, reliable, and healthy experience, both for the, for the senior and for the caregiver. Oh, that, that is fantastic. Yeah, what, great. what great news that is. Well, do you ever anticipate that it will be uh, insurance reimbursable? We, we hope it will by in time for first customer shipments. We're, we're, oh. we're working on that. We're working on that very hard. Uh, because we are a medical device, we are potentially eligible for that. We just have to make sure that we get the private carriers and Medicare Medicaid to agree uh, to do it and get the codes in place for that. But we are, we're working very, very hard to make that happen. That would be great. Okay, well, Ron, if you don't mind, and Tom, I happen to notice that you had posted a uh, an investor testimony about why people are investing. It's just a small little video, and if you don't mind, I'm going to share it. Please, go ahead. Okay. All right, let me do this here. Or brush your teeth in less than 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what Sorry, teeth? I have to skip the, the commercial. What if, what if you don't have teeth? <laughs> Oops, no volume. Can you turn the volume up, Kath? Yeah, sometimes playing a playing a video through one of these uh, video calls doesn't work on the volume. Yeah. You can see all these on our website. Sure. Um, this is Jay Goss. He's our lead institutional investor and a board member. Um, he has a really funny story that he likes to tell about how we had lunch together uh, early on in our relationship. And uh, uh, we brought Jenny into the restaurant. And every three to four minutes, somebody... Hey, This is the part where we um, show Are people. Are you hearing lip this read. or not? No. Oh, you're not. Oh, we thought okay. this was a show for lip readers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to play? <laughs> So it's uh, uh, yeah. If you wouldn't mind posting that, Kathy, but we also have it on the Tombot website under okay. the, under the okay. investors tab down at the bottom. All of these uh, videos are posted. So uh, you know, there, there's we so for the uh, from the from the standpoint of investing in a startup company, we're a high risk company. You know, most startups fail. Um, 
you know, most of our fail in the first two years. We've been around for four and a half years and we still have money in the bank. So that's a good, uh, good, good. thing. But we have a ways to go before we are a successful company. So we're a high risk. We're a high risk company. You certainly shouldn't put more than you can afford to lose uh, into a, co- in a startup company like Tombot. But the opportunity is that you could end up getting very large returns. And that's that's the appeal of, of investing in startup companies. And changes to the law here a few years ago mean that anybody can now participate through platforms uh, such as Start Engine, the regulation crowdfunding platforms. And you had some rewards too for people who are crowdfunding too. They have a chance to go through those, but they're over on the right hand side of that uh, panel. So cer- certain um, investments got you a certain level of, of reward, right? Yes, the uh, the tier. So. What we do is incentivize people who have chosen to invest to incentivize to invest a little bit more. Um, sort of, you know, improves your place in line on the wait list, uh, gets you uh, access to more investor information, uh, uh, including semi-annual major investor calls. And then, if if you invest ten thousand dollars or more, um, we'd be delighted to host a visit to the Tombaugh Robot Shop. Uh, uh, and uh, have a private dinner and tour with our uh, with our team. Oh, nice! Can you meet Jim Henson? Uh, that would be a trick. Unfortunately, <laughs> he passed away. Uh, yeah, I know. But uh, uh, but you can you can see other works by the Jim Henson folks in our office. Yeah, that would be fascinating. You really would. Yeah, okay. we are. Uh, our goal is to be the number one funded. Uh, Healthcare or health tech company on Start Engine during our campaign, and we're I think fifth or sixth right now, but you know, ah. moving up rapidly. So great, congratulations! Thank you. Okay, well that was a wonderful show. Yeah, and thank you. I can tell everyone that I invested because not only do I want it, Jenny, I just really, I just really want to be actively involved in this. I think this is a fabulous product. Uh, just the notion that it can help people with dementia and and i know in our own family we've we've experienced uh, uh alzheimer's and it's a it's a devastating outcome especially when when you don't know what to do and you don't know how to communicate for some reason i think you shared with us tom that you had went to an expo and when you were at the expo people recognized that it in fact that that jenny was in fact um they knew that she was a robot but they felt there there was some kind of a connection that they had with her just by touching her and they said she she really is relaxing me and i think that equates to stuffed animals and things like that but in this particular case this is being designed so that it will very sensitively deal with people that have these major issues so i'm i'm totally sold on it totally sold on it Oh, thank you, Kathy. Yeah, it, it's this is this started off as solving my mom's problem. Uh, I didn't realize at the time so many other people could benefit from that. So it became a business accidentally. But when we realized it could be actually a very big business, that's when we decided we would accept investment money from from other people uh, and and try to do as much good for as many people as possible. And Ron, as you mentioned at the start of the show, we are a social impact play. Um, yep. There, we're we're a qualified small business uh, uh, company, so they're we qualify for tax uh, breaks on on initial earnings on an investment like this. But but more than this, it's really helping make a difference in people's lives. And if, and if we can deliver a nice return on your investment, we'd really like to do that. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> okay. And Rob, double benefit. Now we're, we're we're going. Okay. You might so I'm just going to wrap show. up with a commercial for us. <laughs> so this is our 35th show. And um, last year it occurred to me that we had 34 shows then. That it might be nice to just put it all in one place. So I wrote a book. And, and the book is unique in that every chapter has links to our shows. And most chapters have two or three links. Oh, <laughs> And you bought one. That's what the book looks like. Thanks. But, <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, let me show it. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. That's great. Yes, thanks, Tom. Thanks. So that's okay. that's that's what the the um, paperback version looks like. But we I recommend that you get the Kindle, and and the Kindle is only nine dollars. And Amazon actually has a club where if you join their club, it's free. 
so you can't beat the price. But the key, key thing with the Kindle is you can open up these videos and you have our whole library in front of you. And um, least but not um, last but not least, we really started this whole thing to help financially educate baby boomers. And, and I, I see you know, some of my friends are, are fairly financially sophisticated. Others are not, but they're, they're, I live in a fairly wealthy area. They're all using advisors and they all think that they're golden, that their advisors has really done the right thing for them. But there's a reasonable chance they have not. So you really need to get educated and know the right questions to ask. And the book brings you through how you can protect yourself. And I'm, I'm saying this now way ahead of, so one of the shows four episodes ago was about inflation. And, and that, that was before we all started to feel it. And I'm here to tell you, we're just beginning to feel it. We're going to see, oh, we've printed a lot of money. <laughs> we're going to be seeing serious inflation and it's going to impact both the stock and bond markets. So this, it's our warning and our gift to you for $9, it's a gift. Uh, but Kathy developed a really nice website. So, so please visit us, um, but also support us. You can go on Patreon or Facebook, follow us and all that. And then we have some other websites uh, that are on the screen. I won't go through them all, but we can help you at various levels. Um, some more where you help yourself, others where we'll, we'll help you and take you through with an advisor. So um, that's our commercial. And th okay. thank you. By the All way, right. we, we were doing these twice a month. We'll probably <clears throat> not do them so frequently anymore. We're just going to do them when we have something really interesting to talk about, <laughs> <laughs> like today. Okay, Tom, any last words before we go? I, I just thank you so much for having me. I, I so believe in what you are doing uh, individually and collectively. Educating Thanks. baby boomers is so important. Um, uh, most of our investors are actually baby boomers. So it, it's uh, I feel near and dear, and of course, I'm getting up there. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it's something that's important need and Kathy all the work that you do on the pets and and helping people understand and celebrate their pets. Yeah, uh, right, right. They, uh, such a important work that you do. So thank you very much for having us on the show. Okay, all right. Thank you, everyone, Thanks. and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye now.